Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us for our webinar titled Improving Animal Modeling with 24-7 Home Cage Monitoring in Bio-Exclusion Biocontainment Mouse Housing Systems. This is Liam Sanyo from Inside Scientific and I'm very pleased to be your host for today's event. Our session is sponsored by Technoplast and will feature John Hazanaw, DVM, CEO and Principal Consultant at Lab Animal Consultants and Stefano Guburo, PhD, Scientific Director of Digital Lab Solutions at Technoplast. Our speakers today will discuss current biosafety requirements and how home cage monitoring can support studies using bioexclusion and biocontainment systems. And now very pleased to introduce our first presenter, John Hazanaw. John, thanks so much for joining us today and feel free to take it away whenever you're ready. Okay, so I am uh, very happy to be here. Thank you for attending. Uh, I would like to go ahead and first start out about talking about biosafety. And the main thing that I want to do here is go ahead and look at what our key objectives will be with both bioexclusion and bioinclusion. And to look at the key objectives we have, I want to talk about accelerating bioexclusion and biocontainment research outcomes through advanced caging systems. And then what are the practical differences in bioexclusion, biocontainment caging systems? And learn how the locomotor activity serves as a digital biomarker for the animal welfare and infectious diseases and understand how to improve the translational value of these animal models via home cage monitoring. We will both, uh, Stefano and myself, will uh, have practical relevant information for you that you can use at your facilities. So the first thing I want to do is look at bioexclusions and talk about the Human Microbiome Project and the timelines that were associated with that. And the timelines started in 2005, 2007, then went on to 2015 in the exploration phase. And we had a paradigm shift in 15 through 18, and then 2018 on, we have been living with integration and looking at what is happening there. We talk about the Human Microbiome Project. We have <clears throat> two areas that we first talk about. The first phase, which is 2007 through 2012, predominantly looking at the intragenomics and the computational tools to develop what the microbiomes are. And the second phase was focused on the initiative to create the first integrated databases of biological properties. And this occurred 2013 through 2015. When we start talking about microbiomes, the thing that we are all focused on tends to be the gut microbiome. But there are many others. And one of the most recent ones that we're seeing more and more focus on, of course, has been the nasal and respiratory microbiomes related to our current pandemic. I want to borrow a term from one of my colleagues in talking about a tsunami effect where we went from then allergy to omics and notobiotics to microbiomics and focusing more on not just what is there, but what occurs because what is there and how that affects then the disease processes and other things that are happening within the body. And if we look at the publications related to this, we can see that the notobiotic publications have been uh, occurring and continue to occur. And there's a change in the terminology that we're seeing from notobiotics to microbiome, microbiome being the preferred term and the consistent term that's being used that way. And if we look at just obesity as a situation with the microbiota, the gut microbiota, we can see there's a linear relationship in terms of these publications that is continuing and, and stays continuing. Uh, this particular study ended in 2017, but it, it continues on now in a linear fashion, and we see that it's occurring throughout different studies that are going on. And looking at the gut microbiome and relationships of then these very uh, prominent high-impact references, we saw that first there were the establishment of what is there, then the looking, the mechanistic understanding of what is occurring between different microbiomes, and then how those different microbiomes affect the disease treatment process. And this was gut-related, 
But we're also seeing that now in the respiratory and lung areas for the microbiomes there. And this is expanding out these research needs, especially with our current pandemic issues and how that is affecting some of the research throughput that is needed for this. So in terms of the housing, which is the focus I want to really uh, look at here, is with pre-1960 germ-free housing on the notobiotic side of it, we were looking really at stainless steel isolators. And then in 1960 on, Philip Trexel invented the flexible film isolators. And those flexible film isolators are still presently being used, as you can see in the upper right-hand corner of the slide. And below that is the hermetically sealed systems. So these are the two most present uh, type of systems that we're seeing in use. The isolators, flexible film isolators, have been ones that have been uh, modified to create quad situations where you have two over twos. Um, and again, this is related to throughput and space needs in relationship to the studies. Hematically sealed systems have been in vogue uh, in the last uh, 10 years, or five years actually mostly, and looking at those as a replacement to these flexible film isolators. But the film isolators, as shown here, are used predominantly for long-term studies, and I wanted to find long-term housing as being eight weeks or greater and eight weeks being the issue of where it is a lot of resource maintenance to go ahead and set these units up and to maintain these units and to keep them going that way. Um, so there is a, a, a total investment there and we seem to uh, be seeing where eight weeks is kind of a uh, determined point where for long-term housing, it's more beneficial for the isolator setups in that, depending on the volume of the animals that you're needing as well in relationship to this. Further examples of this are some of the more solid uh, isolators here, and you can see both for wild type breeding mice and then also some of your gem mice, uh, genetically engineered mice um, that are maintained in, these, in this fashion. And the other thing I wanted to point out for this particular talk is that uh, with the microbiome, the gut microbiome especially, we've studied this intensively and we've seen that there has been uh, very much a uh, bacterial diversity as we age, but also individual variability decreases as we age. Thus, when you're doing your studies, there's going to be a difference in when you want to pinpoint and look at the type of aging process here. Uh, the birth to the one month is very uh, important and critical in, in setting the stage for all the microbiome and how it is developing from there. Um, so there are different time elements, and not only time elements, but cultural elements as well. There's a lot of individual diversity related to cultural aspects in relationship to geographical uh, areas, as well as food uh, amounts available and how people are eating culturally and how the food is processed and ways that the food then affects the uh, microbiome, the gut microbiome. And there is a relevance to that in the respiratory and lung microbiome as well. The measuring tools um, that we have available, both DNA sequencing and some RNA as well, uh, relate to then what is there. The metagenome is what is produced, and the metabloom is the metabolic products from that, and being able to characterize those metabolic products back into defining what the microbiome might be related to that as, as a biomarker for those. And that is being done more and more frequently, as we mentioned with the tsunami wave that had occurred back then. So our other tools that we look at are the film, the <clears throat> um, solid isolators that we've mentioned earlier, as well as the hematically sealed cages, and then taking either healthy or diseased animals and transplanting whatever microbiome you want into that germ-free animal or the genetically engineered uh, animal. And then in the human side, doing the exact same with that, and then being able to different uh, microbiomes for that. So again, it gets back to a space optimization question, and what we're looking at with the flexible film isolators, I mentioned the quad units before, and this is what you're seeing in the lower right-hand corner. Uh, you have a max of four microbiomes related to that quad situation. Uh, when you look at the 
rack situations for the ISO systems or the hermetically sealed systems that we're mentioning today is the other option for maintaining these animals. You can see that you can have up to 36 different microbiomes. Um, and actually, the newer caging rack systems allow 48 uh, single-sided or can go up to 96 on a double-sided rack in relationship to that. So you're optimizing your space, your footprint space. Uh, thoroughput is a, is a big issue in a lot of the facilities, notobiotic facilities that I have association with and understanding. There is a little bit of a waiting list, if you will, for going ahead and getting studies placed. And we're seeing that now in some of the biocontainment areas, too, related to our new issues with COVID and trying to get studies in and, and get the, some of the work done in regards to that. Um, there are trade-offs with using the hermetically sealed systems, and we'll talk a little bit about that. I just wanted to show that in this slide that we have both the ISO cage system for the germ-free and notobiotics, which is the ISO positive. And then on the biocontainment side, we have the ISO negative cage uh, related for that. And there are different airflow systems and ways that these are working. The real use of these cages came with that tsunami wave when there was the throughput issue and the problems of having uh, enough studies being done in a, in a timely fashion. And this introduced then in 2014-2015 in in a huge uh, use of these cages in a continued use going forward here. And we're seeing more and more use of these uh, as we get into other situations such as currently. So I just wanted to go over <clears throat> some of the experimental procedures that can be done uh, using this system. And this system is uh, based on an ISO uh, biosafety cabinet. And the biosafety cabinet then also works in conjunction with the hematically sealed cages, where you're bringing your sterile cages in the notobiotic sense of it uh, into the ISO biosafety station and doing that by a high disinfectant dip tank that occurs on the right-hand side of the cabinet and bringing the cages then into that cabinet, working with the cages in the cabinet in the sterile environment or highly disinfected environment, and then going ahead and moving uh, the <clears throat> cages over to the um, area for work. You can see there are different procedures that can be done here. I'm not gonna list those all off for you. A lot of these require a lot of manual dexterity and tactile feel um, and staff that I have been associated with and who have worked in this environment prefer the ISO biosafety station work areas related to the ability to do more of the fine procedures that are needed at times in relationship to working within a uh, isolator. And you can see the glove differences here with the um, uh, different tactile sensitivity and, and ability that way for the staff to be able to perform these. These are pictures of then the ISO biosafety station. On the right-hand side, you have a older version. On the left, a newer version. Um, both of these stations have the dip tank that I had mentioned for going ahead and doing uh, the high disinfection of the cages coming into the unit. Um, this would be for, again, the notobiotic or germ-free uh, functions that you're doing that way. And alternatively, with biocontainment, you would have a uh, contaminated inside of the cabinet and then maintaining that contamination within the cabinet. And then as you're moving the cage out through the dip tank, you're disinfecting it and bring that up for the room use in regards to that. The, about the diversity that you have with the <clears throat> notobiotic uh, facility in relationship to different studies that can be done uh, on one rack is demonstrated in this slide. We can use anexic mice, mono or bicolonized mice, or total fecal transplant mice uh, all on one rack, and the diversity within that rack showing the different areas here for uh, those animals with that overall. So it is diverse that way in regards to different study types, and the same can be done with biocontainment in relationship to the ISO uh, negative cage uh, for allowing many different studies on one rack. 
This is just showing then the bio exclusion component with the anexic animal starting that way and how you would go ahead and have a autoclave cage inside a cylinder um, it transferred into then a, iso a flexible film isolator and populating those animals uh, into that cage and then bringing that cage out from that isolator. And once you've brought that cage out from that isolator, you can then pop put that on the ISO rack. Uh, as the cage is on the ISO rack, it's maintained that way in a very positive airflow, uh, double filtered HEPA into the cage. For the notobiotic side, double HEPA filtered out of the cage in the containment side. And then passing, once you need to go ahead and do any work with that cage, passing that cage into the biosafety cabinet through the disinfectant dip tank and then bringing it into the ISO safety cabinet, doing your manipulations and procedures, and then bringing that cage back out and going ahead and allowing you to uh, move with the cage back onto the rack. In a biocontainment situation, the cycle is reversed where you would go ahead and bring uh, the cage back out through the seven, eight, and, or I'm sorry, seven, six, and five uh, positions there back into the rack that way for the dip tank. And um, these cages are totally immersed. Uh, once they're removed off the rack, you have 15 to 20 minutes of air and the pressures in these cages main, are maintained. If it's an ISO positive cage, the pressure remains positive. If it's ISO negative, the pressure remains negative. Um, and again, the animals are well maintained in these cages as they're kept that way. In addition to uh, the ISO safety cabinet, um, Technoplast has gone ahead and, and uh, made a decontamination cart which allows six cages to be placed on this cart. And in the case of the ISO positive cages for uh, autoclaving and sterilization prior to going ahead and using the cage, in the case of ISO negative, decontaminating the cage and uh, autoclaving it after its use in, re in regards to keeping those cages sterile that way. And then the tools I just wanna emphasize again that we have are the ISO positive cage on the left hand side of your slide here and that is for specifically bio exclusion where HEPA filtered air from the rack is then passed through the HEPA filter on the cage unit itself and these are sealed ports in the back of the cage um, that are valve sealed with springs um, and again maintain that that seal uh, anytime the cage is removed from the, the rack uh, so you have double help coming in. And then on the other side of the slide here, the biocontainment component, the ISO negative cage, which allows for HEPA filtered air coming into the cage in a passive port that way, and then pass through a HEPA filter before exiting the cage, where it then goes back into the rack plenum, and that is HEPA filtered out before it exits the rack. Uh, so double HEPA filter exit on the biocontainment side. With our bi ISO negative biocontainment studies, um, what I wanted to emphasize is some of the studies that have currently been done here, especially the MERS COVID infection uh, listed here uh, for vaccine development. And I think we're going to be seeing a lot of this with the COVID vaccine development as well. Uh, in relationship to what studies are needed to be done and the high throughput with those studies. Uh, we also saw that Napa virus uh, is another product that has been used in these cages uh, recently and <clears throat> very successfully. These are in BSL-3 uh, environments. And again, another BSL-3 environment with a bacterial agent, Bercolia pseudomalli. And <clears throat> also Zika virus has been used uh, in regards to this. So I want to start to introduce then the DVC, the digitally ventilated cage for ISO. The DVC has been used very successfully and for uh, many years now in regards to the, ISO, the IVC wraps, the green line that Technoplast has. Uh, but this is a system that allows a automated 24 seven data collection from the home cage. And there are many advantages that we're seeing with this. 
The first advantage, of course, is the facility management and animal welfare component based on the locomotor detection. You have better animal daily welfare, especially during the nocturnal hours when these animals are most active. And this records them 24-7 in relationship to that. There are also advantages with bedding change, which Stefano will, hand, will cover more in detail a little bit in regards to that. And flooding detection uh, in the ISO system, if the, your water bottle were to flood, uh, that would be detected right away. Uh, in the IVC systems, when there is auto watering, that is detected as well. On the research side of it, there's 24-7 locomotor data collection for more reliable data. Uh, and this is very important in terms of this study translatability. There's high throughput data for this as well and reduced bias and related to standard metrics. And overall, what we're seeing is then reduced animal handling and cage handling related to the DVC for this. And that's very important uh, in regards to our biosafety components here that we really wanted to go ahead and focus on. And what I wanted to do is thank you for uh, attending here today and uh, we'll entertain questions at the end. And I wanna hand this over to Stefano who will really gauge us in deep conversation on the DVC component and how it can benefit you and your research. Thank you. Okay, thank you, John, for taking it over and giving to me the word. My name is uh, Stefano Caburro. And today I would like to talk more about how home cage monitoring, specifically locomotion, can help us in biosafety and biocontainment studies. Let's start with three points in animal science. So first of all, mice spend 99% of their time in the home cage and they're more active at night, but most of the experiment are done during the day. Second, environmental factor, cage change, personal entering is often underconsidered. And there are very much effect like personal that can affect those type of studies, especially for longitudinal studies. Third, locomotion activity is generally done outside of the home cage and it's only a snapshot. What about the animal welfare? And what about the other 23 minutes, 23 hours and 50 minutes, for instance? That is why we at Tekken Plus thought that we can build something around the home cage, which goes in the home rack, and basically automatically and non-intrusively detect 24-7 data. It helps to reduce the animal handling and the stress it detects also the animal during the night period. It is high throughput data and we can also provide standardized metrics and therefore reduce bias. The technology works as shown here in the video. So this is a typical IVC cage that goes in a rack and beneath a rack, there is a board which is consisted of 12 electrodes. You show in a second. These 12 electrodes generate small electromagnetic fields at four times a second. And then when you insert the cage, as the operator is doing right now, basically you see from the side, there is these small electromagnetic fields, which are a little bit reduced when the cage is inset, even more so when the bed is there. But then when the mice gets there, it gets even more reduced. And because we can then, we know where basically the mice are located. If it is in the case of one mouse, we can track it. And in the case of more mice, we can tell the total cage activity. So what about data flow? So the data is generated at the rack level. It goes through an interface into the cloud, and then it can be displayed through a browser called DVC Analytics. And basically the data would look like that. You will have your day and night uh, data, And you will see that during night, animals becomes more active as shown by the gray, um, gray bars. And during the day, they are less active. I told you that we can uh, track single animals. And because we know the distribution of those electrodes, it has been validated by our uh, data analysts 
uh, also by the publication by Fabio Anello, that we can also calculate distance and velocity of single cage animals. If you want to do, or you to, if you want to know more about the science which has gone around, myself and also Jonah Moore from GSK have done some virtual poster on the same platform. And also we hosted a recent webinar um, on uh, Marianne Liebert. But then let's move on to the ISO cage as ISO N that John mentioned before. And we brought the DVC technology onto it. And just to basically represent the slide that John presented before, we can do all of the points that I mentioned before. So 24-7 locomotive data, high throughput, and standardized metrics. And also the important part of the animal welfare. So it's only one. But then how does that apply to biocontainment or bioexclusion? Well, let's start from biocontainment. And I think uh, important is to start now from COVID-19. And I like to start from the symptoms in humans. And in humans, probably the most for uh, seen symptoms are fever, cough, shortness of breath, and tiredness. And there has been a number of animal models reported so far in which the virus has been studied and the vaccine has been evaluated, like rhesus macaques, ferrets, and also the serum hamsters. But as animal models also have the, those animals have limitation or other consideration, especially no human primates and large animals are expensive. There is ethical concern with all the animal models, but even more so, there is a perception that using animals in some state, um, large animals, is an issue. And the scalability of those animals, so meaning I need a population of animals that I can use for my research in short time, is an issue. With mice, you can get very quickly up to the, the N number that you need. And moreover, Transportation of animals has also been an issue in the recent past. So there was an article on the 6th of March in the New York Times that proposed to revisit the mouse model because not every mouse model can be used with COVID or for COVID research. And basically they presented the K18 HEC2 mice created for the SARS. So basically K18 is the promoter uh, of the human angiotensin converting enzyme receptor which is used by the by the coronavirus to enter in the cell. And K18 is the promoter expressed by epithelial cells in the lung. Well, this animal model um, has been produced. It has been around for five years and then has been called. Now at, at Jackson, they'd be, as we speak, make available. And they will be available soon. But in the meanwhile, just yesterday, I came across the publication that basically showed that in China, such mouse model was already produced and has been sent to nature. And those mouse models basically show symptoms similar to humans. So this shows fatigue, this shows loss of body weight, and eventually they die. And the virus is only found in the lungs. There are other models that can be used to study other symptoms of the coronavirus, like the SE2 knockout and BALPC. This is just a screenshot of the Taconic uh, webinar that was presented and listed basically many other models that can be used. But then what can we do with those models? Well, John presented, of course, the isolator. We can keep the animals and do visual inspection or we can put them in uh, either IVC cages or ISO N plus the digital ventilated cage for the locomotion. And uh, I'll try to give you some insights of how and why is locomotion very important in this respect. So now, first of all, the IVC has been already used for this type of research. This is a picture of a lab in Rome, which is currently developing with Oxford um, the uh, one of the vaccines, one of the candidate vaccines. But before to understand how the locomotion is in coronavirus research animals, we have to understand a bit the baseline, so the physiology of animals. And this is a study in which Jackson, Karolinska, and also CNR participated. So basically they evaluated, can we use this technology to phenotype animals? They use C57 Black 6J for animals in a cage. 
and they look at uh, night and day activity of the animals, locomotor activity. The day is in blue, in red we have the night, and you see that the animals are much more active during the night. So you see a clear diurnal locomotor activity difference. And then when you try to understand how the locomotion works in infectious disease or more specifically to viral infection, we can actually move to the next study. This was a study with H1N1 virus, coronavirus, that was for the Spanish flu, the result of the Spanish flu, and activity and temperature were measured with implanted device. On the left side, you have the body temperature, and on the dash line indicates a viral inoculation. What you will notice is that with the blue arrows, that as soon as the virus is applied, there is a drop of the body temperature, probably indicating a lethargic response. And then if you look at the locomotor activity on the right side, you see that especially at night, the high locomotion seen in control animals is basically lost. So you have a loss of circadian rhythm. So to summarize, you have hypothermia, so possibly lethargy, and also loss of circadian locomotor activity. But then what happens if we give an antivirus or a vaccine that should block the activity? Well, there was another experiment with bulbs in mice with the Venezuelan equine encephalitis virus, which is also BSL-3 type of virus uh, measured with DSI technology. Um, activity and temperature were measured. And on the left side, you see control, virus plus vaccine, and virus-only animals. And what you will notice is that control and vaccine virus plus vaccine treated animals have the same circadian rhythm, so very conserved pattern, whereas virus treated only animals have first an increase in the body temperature and then a further increase after seven to eight days and then a further drop, most likely indicating death of the animals. And if you look at the activity, the pattern for control and vaccine animals is again very, very similar. Whereas, whereas virus treaty only uh, animals have an increase in the locomotor activity immediately one day after the injection and then a drop to almost 50% of the activity and down at day six to almost zero indicated probably death. So there is the same activity pattern of vaccine treaty animals as for control as compared to the infected or virus treated uh, animals. So if you were to summarize everything, we could probably tell that locomotor activity seems to demonstrate to be predictive of virus pathological and use effects and its reversal by fissious vaccine. The DVC has been used in the past by the Jackson Labs to assess the locomotor activity in normal uh, mice. And the technology is really new to biocontainment, we just started this year. So we lack of data, but because we think data can be transferred from also from other pathological models, we can look at what happened to other pathological models. And in this example, for instance, um, the researchers treated group of animals with three, four, and five in a cage with a cytostatic drug. And then they, the baseline is basically the day when they received the injection. And then on the left side, there is activity. On the right side, there is the body weight. So if you look at the activity, on day zero, which would be day one, there is a drop of the activity, no matter how many animals were in the cage, down to 50%. And then the activity recovers over time and go back to at day seven to baseline or as compared to vehicle treated animals. The body weight was taken every second day and there is only a drop of between two and 4% of the body weight after two days. So, Based off of these results, we could tell that hypoactivity down to 50% is detected prior to the onset of the body weight loss. So if we summarize everything, locomotor activity demonstrate a great potential as an additional diagnostic tool in infectious disease, as well as to other experimental settings. The DVC might reduce the need to open of the cage and therefore minimizing virus exposure and the core body temperature and body weight, at least in rodents, should be used probably in adjunction to locomotor activity to assess reliably animal welfare in such study type. This is regarding bicontainment. What happened to the bioexclusion? Well, in bioexclusion, 
there are many studies that have been done, especially in the microbiome research. And one of those is the, to understand what are the interactions between the gut and the brain. And this is just a cartoon represented, representing psychiatric patients. And through fecal transplantation, which John already presented, you can basically take the microbiome of those patients, put it into germ-free animals, and then study the behavior of the animals. And actually, very recently, um, some researcher at uh, Radboud University did that type of study. And what they did was the following. They took ADHD patients, so with attention def deficit hyperactivity, took the microbiome and put it in germ-free animals. And then they look at the behavior with the hypothesis of uh, um, seeing an increased anxiety in those animals. Anxiety in animals is generally measured through different behavioral uh, ways. One of those, and the most used probably, is the open field. The open field is a big arena in which the animals are placed. And if the animals go in the center, they are considered less anxious. And if they stay more in a corner, they are considered more anxious. But because it's a locomotion-based test, you should first check what the baseline activity of those animals is. In fact, the researcher check during the day in the DVC what the baseline activity looks like. In green is control, in red ADHD treated animals. And you will notice that there is no difference in the baseline activity. And then if you look at the open field again, it's this big arena. The center duration of the HD animals is lower, indicating more uh, anxious like behavior. The corner duration is higher. But the periphery duration, so the overall activity, is the same as for the DVC. So the total activity periphery duration is confirmatory of DVC findings. So if you know final conclusion now, we could tell probably that DVC can help to detect six animal in infectious disease studies. We did also a LinkedIn article if you are interested. The DVC can aid to detect and confirm locomotor activity pattern in germ-free or nude mice using for notobiotics research. And the technology is already validated. I mean, uh, think of virus or vaccine produced like Moderna now. They don't have to go through animal study because there was something produced before for SARS or MERS or Ebola. And this applies also to other type of treatments. So the DVC system, ISO cage, B and N represent a unique opportunity to empower disagreements and provide useful 24-7 data for scientists in biocontainment and bioexclusion research field. With that, I would like to thank you for your participation and uh, I leave the stage to Liam. All right, thanks so much, Stefano and John, for your great presentations. Moving on to the Q&A session. Uh, the first question of the day here is, uh, what are the advantages of using the ISO negative caging system in a BSL-3 level suite? Uh, and John, I think I'll direct this one to you first. So I would start by uh, answering this and saying that you really need to evaluate the risk. Uh, it's a risk assessment situation in all of the biosafety level suites that we work in. and the the thing that we need to do is reduce the risk. The advantage of using a ISO negative system in that uh, particular environment is doing increased primary barrier containment uh, related to the hermetically sealed component of that. And with that, it also allows uh, lack of cross-contamination if there were ever to occur uh, in regard to your uh, containment that way as well. So it's very uh, effective that way and very beneficial um, in relationship to that. Um, and that's one of the primary reasons for using that. Uh, the other advantage is, as I had mentioned, from a staff point of view, um, it seems that there may be better uh, ability to manipulate animals outside of isolators uh, and moving more into a ISO biosafety cabinet or a safety cabinet 
and doing manipulations in there uh, related to that uh, situation. Excellent. All right. Uh, next question here, and Stefano, maybe I'll give this one to you, but is it possible to update an existing ISO cage system with DVC? And if so, what are the, the minimal requirements? Yes. So there is good news. We can update any existing um, ISO N or P system. So it takes two hours to our engineers to do that approximately. And regarding the requirements, um, I think uh, there is the interface and then uh, the boards that goes beneath. And for the rest, I think uh, can be take offline because it depends on the units that are out there. And I would just invite you know you to contact your local representative or send an email to me, and then we can then discuss point by point and see what we can do to help you. Excellent. All right. Um... Another question here, what are, what are the trade-offs of using uh, an iso-positive caging versus isolator caging? And uh, John, I'll hand this one to you. Okay, thank you, uh, Liam. And the trade-offs would really be how you're working with the iso-positive system um, related to the fact that you can go ahead and have, uh, again, better work with the animals in, in relationship to that and some of the abilities to do that. Um, the thorough put is the other uh, thing that we're looking at here in relationship to the amount of studies that can be done for this. So uh, it's beneficial to the investigator to uh, have this type of system to allow a greater thorough put of the studies going into uh, the rooms and the activity that way. Um, the, there is going to be a little more work in going ahead and doing each study when you're, uh, working with the cages, um, because of the, uh, having to move the cage into, uh, the ISO biosafety cabinet. Um, <clears throat> but again, that's, uh, if you're doing a short-term study, um, these seem to be more the way people are doing this than if you're doing long-term studies with the isolators. Um, and this this tends to be the trend that I'm seeing overall uh, in relationship to some of these. Excellent. All right, thanks, John. And so here's, here's a question, Stefano. Uh, maybe you can address this one. How does the DVC system alert scientists about the welfare of mice? Right. Um, it wasn't presented today, but the DVC can also do the welfare part. Basically, the DVC per se can also check in the night the activity of the animals. So basically, the term is a baseline through an AI algorithm. And then if there are hyper or hyper locomotion detected in the cage, it can basically signal that to the researcher or to the person who is responsible, to the technician. And then in the next morning, you find a small task that says check that cage and can be highlighted also on the rack. So this is a very nice way to complement welfare and was as well as science. So there is data getting out and put it on your browser, but also this type of task if you don't want to use uh, browser related things that evaluates basically the activity of the animals. Excellent. All right. Thanks, Stefano. Um, and Next question here, what are the benefits for staff to use either the iso-negative or iso-positive caging systems? Uh, and John, maybe you can address this one. So if, the, if we're really looking at isolator versus the iso systems, the ergonomics with the isolators tend to be a issue as well uh, for some of the staff um, in terms of the ability to reach in, the ability to uh, have to stoop down uh, in the quad systems that I'd shown you, especially the lower units. Um, those are complicated for some of the staff, and then the upper units are complicated for some of our staff that are um, uh, height restricted. And the uh, they're better ergonomic uh, situations for the staff to be using the um, ISO N or ISO P systems. Um, the protection levels um, are similar in regards to both the um, 
isolators and the ISO and our ISO P systems. And uh, again, getting back to manipulation and tactile sensitivity and other things that are being done on some of the animals in isolators can be, in my opinion, better done in the um, safety cabinets related to uh, the amount of gloves and uh, ability of the individuals to manipulate the animals more readily in those uh, systems uh, versus the isolators overall. So those would be my answers for that. Excellent. All right. Well, here's an interesting question here. Can human activity in front of the cage, so for example, cage changes, be tracked? And how is that correlated with the activity of animals in the cage? Uh, Stefano, I'll give this one to you. Yeah. Yes, so in general, um, any human interaction, so also en entering the room, basically elevates the heart rate, every single physiological parameter. And uh, we at Technoplus developed the RAC environmental monitoring called REM that basically monitor light of the RAC, light, um, humidity, human presence up to a uh, certain distance. And then we can basically correlate that. And I can give you the example of um, cage change. If you do just move the cage a bit, um, the activity will increase a lot up to three hours after the event and eventually sometimes also in the night afterwards. So there is a lot of um, effects due to opening the door and everything. And all the things can be monitored and see, seen on the cage. And that, that's why... In my introductory slide, there was this unseen environmental factor. Now it can be finally uh, tracked through the DVC. Perfect. Um, another question here. For, for what research would you recommend the use of the isonegative caging system? And what are the time frames associated with it? Um, maybe, John, I'll, I'll give this one to you. Thank you, Liam. Uh, the research that I would recommend is any of the biosafety two plus type studies that might be conducted within a facility, as well as the BSL three or above. Uh, these systems can be used uh, in relationship to that. Uh, it's specifically designed for BSL three system or BSL safety environments, a BSL three, and <clears throat> this is a, a system that will then reduce the risk to individuals, to the animals, and also to uh, cross-contamination of studies if there are multiple studies going on within the room that way. So any of those situations on a time frame, which is another part of that question, I believe, um, the time frames are uh, anywhere with the, as I mentioned with isolators earlier, uh, in kind of an eight-week situation and below um, are preferential for these type of systems where um, shorter studies um, and maintaining them that way. Um, and those are best suited for these systems in general. Again, it depends upon the amount of uh, animals you might have in the study as well. So smaller amounts of animals in the study would promote use of these systems uh, as well in relationship to that for the longer term studies is what I mean in that aspect. Excellent, thanks, John. Uh, here's a great, a great question from Christina. She's asked if the uh, ISO or DVC cage systems can be integrated with partner technologies, uh, for example, DSI telemetry. And Stefano, maybe you can get so, uh, uh, to this one. Yeah, I used to work for the SI before, and we did some tests on normal IVC uh, with some blood pressure device, and we didn't see in normal single cage animals, and we didn't see any interaction. So I don't suspect um, any interaction with uh, transmitters that have, 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 you know, like temperature, blood pressure, they have or ECG, they have very high amplitude signal. We have to test without the type of transmitter, but Short answer is we are testing it and uh, more tests has to be done. Excellent. Uh, thanks, Stefano. Uh, next question here. Uh, so given animal well-beings and the three R's of animal testing, uh, do you think that 
locomotion measurement in group housed animals would only provide uh, the total group activity? Or can you evaluate actual individual animals locomotion activity as well? Um, Stefano, uh, maybe you can get this one. Yes, so it's a group response, obviously. Um, we cannot, because we don't implement any RFID, we don't know which animal is which. Um, but then if all the animals are, let's say that you have three animals treated and one not treated, and you would like to see does the animal not treated differ from the other three, there is always the behavioral component, this empathy theory that says the other animal is not going to be behaving like the three. So we, we take the cage as, you know, as a cage activity and we cannot tell individually what the animals are doing. Um, and, uh, though we saw that if you evaluate the cage activity is very similar to the average of single animal activity or as you like. So we don't think that, um, it's, it's a need, but uh, we haven't seen yet the, a great advantage of it. Excellent. Thanks, Stefano. Um, question here from Brad that kind of goes back to group housing. How many animals can you monitor per cage? Uh, John, what's your experience with group housed animals and how many you can do? As Stefano had said earlier, and, and this is um, the way that the DVC works, it's a group average overall. So our stocking densities of these cages are five animals per cage. So you can monitor the whole group that way as five animals. Um, or, you know, if you have individual housing, um, the individual animal going down to three animals is being, being seen more commonly in some of these uh, infectious disease studies related to um, the <coughs> group uh, that arrangement. So anywhere from one to five um, can be monitored that way, but it is an average of how many you do have in there over one. Stefano, do you have John, uh, no, I think um, it's uh, really get, getting back to the point that you just mentioned. And also my point before is an average activity. Excellent. Um, here's a good question here. Uh, what backup systems are in place if there are power outages to, to stop the AHU working? And does the DVC have an alert for this? Uh, and this question actually comes from um, Joanna Moore, who did a did a poster with us. But uh, yeah, Stefano, maybe you can handle uh, this one. <laughs> yes. So the data are recorded. So if all the electricity goes down and the data until the point to where, um, you know, the data were there because the data goes first on the interface and then they go up to the, to the, uh, server. There will be information and our service can actually see this information. We have some tracking and, uh, we have also an alarm that has been sent through the guardian. It's called the system. And if there are more information needed, we can actually, uh, take it offline because it's going to be a bit too complicated. But the answer is yes, we can provide you the information. Excellent. And I just Thanks. like to I add think in, in the interest of time... Oh, sorry. Liam, on the, on the biosafety side of this, we didn't uh, mention that, but there's a battery 24-hour backup on all of the ISO systems that way. So there's never a power loss or issue for providing the HEPA filtered air into those cages. Excellent. All right. Um, thanks, John Stefano. And I think in the interest of time, we'll make this next question uh, the last one. Uh, and it's monitoring temperature is extremely important in some of the studies that we are running. Uh, how can you do that using this system? Um, maybe, John, do yeah. you have any experience with monitoring temperature? Or, Stefano, maybe you can comment. I'll let Stefano comment on that. Yes, I think uh, it's really integration with, uh, you know, um, Technologies, Lapata technology like DSI and having telemetry and activity, you know, working together. As it was my conclusion in the presentation was saying you have to monitor several parameters to be sure that you're really looking at the welfare of the animals because the response, like for instance, to the virus can be different in terms of temperature and the activity could actually help to better describe the animal model and translate that. 
All right. Excellent. Well, thanks so much, uh, John and Stefano, for all your fantastic insights today, uh, both in your presentations as well as the Q&A session. And thank you to the audience for participating and, and being part of this. And uh, wish you all to stay safe and uh, be productive in your research endeavors. Thank you. Thank you very much. And if there are further questions, reach out to us and uh, ask questions, and we will be happy to answer them. Stay safe. Thank you. Definitely. Thanks, everyone, for taking time out of your day to attend our webinar. And we hope that you found the information presented both educational and applicable to your research. And last but certainly not least, a very big thank you to our sponsor, Technoplast. So in closing, thank you again for taking part in this Inside Scientific webinar, and we look forward to having you with us again soon. Have a wonderful day, everyone.